We have just discussed an alternative to the linear effect-oriented approach, one that looks at message construction and interpretation and leaves room for multiple meanings of a message. The third perspective I want to discuss is a continuation of this line of thought, but shifts the focus to cultural and social aspects of communication. This approach deals with how we use communication to give meaning to the world around us, construct our own social reality, the role of communication in group dynamics and social interaction. This perspective makes use of insights from the field of uh, sociology, social psychology and anthropology, where much attention is given to the social context in which communication takes place. It sees communication as the means to share and reinforce ideas, thereby constantly creating and adapting our culture. Also, it sees people as social animals. As such, we are constantly involved in social group dynamics. To illustrate this approach, let's examine this communication model proposed by Newcomb as early as 1953. The model starts out with two familiar elements, sender and receiver. Let's call them person A and person B. Newcomb thought that the main purpose of communication is to maintain some sort of balance, a harmony or equilibrium in a social system. He therefore introduced a new element, the social environment that person A and B share. We'll call the shared social environment X for now. These three elements, A, B and X, are all connected to each other in one social system. If one element changes, this changes the relationship of the three. I will give an example. Let's say person A is David and person B is Shirley. Shirley and David are colleagues in the same department, so this is their shared social environment. If David quits his job to work somewhere else, this means they no longer have that same shared social environment, their workplace and shared office lunches. This will inevitably change the relationship between Dave and Shirley. Perhaps they'll decide they enjoyed their lunch break so much they will now have coffee each month, even though they don't work together anymore, thereby going from colleagues to friends. In another scenario, David changes jobs within the company and now becomes Shirley's boss. This will also influence their relationship somehow. Will they still continue to have friendly lunches each day? X can take many forms. The place you work, political allegiance, a group you belong to, it can even be a person. Let's say X is another co-worker named Ellen. David and Shirley both like Ellen, until Ellen and Shirley get into a fight. Now David's relationship with the both of them will change. He might choose sides or set himself up as a neutral party. Regardless of his choice, a new social balance will be found and equilibrium restored. This, according to Newcomb, is the main function of communication. Later, other scientists have continued with this idea, making other theories that specifically looked at mediated, individual, mass or group communication. In later weeks, we'll go more in depth on this. To go back to the core of Newcomb's model, and also the core of this third approach, communication helps us get along with each other, make sense of the social world around us and enables us to function as social animals. Therefore, it's crucial for a stable and healthy society, because without communication, we don't really feel part of society. We can't position ourselves in social reality, for instance, by aligning ourselves with in-groups or opposing ourselves against out-groups. Central to this approach is the notion that people construct a cultural and social reality by constantly communicating values, attitudes and ideas. This idea is sometimes called social constructionism.